We used to seeing things which are happening in a very regimental fashion, you know, including everything which is happening over here. Uh, now, what I am essentially going to talk about is a complete bifurcation to what has been talked about over here. Major of the speakers and everybody is over here have been talking about what they did, you know, and this whole idea of that we are special, including myself. You know, I'm standing over here on the stage, and it's is it something which is I'm special? So, as Jay Krishnamurti always basically talks out that if there is some kind of equality among the relationships, the flow of knowledge is equal and mutual, and that's something which is very important. Now, what happens is when somebody is basically not equal and says, "I'm special, I'm unique, I'm great," you know, "I'm iconic." Then they start looking at people who are basically at the bottom base and saying, "You are ordinary. I don't need you." You know, and hence basically it starts creating a some kind of disparities, you know, some kind of basically imbalance and the kind of inequilibrium at this point. So what I'm going to go about and talk about is ordinariness. You know, the ordinary people, ordinary houses, ordinary things. You know, and how basically. The entire ordinary comes together as we, as something which is collective and not as I. I am special. No, we are special. Uh, if you look at this man, normal shepherd, goat. Basically, he has got all the goat shapes. I met him somewhere on the basically going to Khambad, and he knows the name of all the sheep. He knows what basically land belongs. He knows all the people around, and he has got far more knowledge of that land than anybody of us over here. Compared to that, we have got basically Steve Tyler, you know, huge iconic figure, great, you know, media goes gaga -ga about it, but then he only goes gaga, -ga and nobody basically recognizes that shepherd. Similar thing happens also with basically architecture. No, with houses, which are ordinary houses. Now, if you look at this house, uh, seems pretty ordinary, but this is actually made by a local person. He has basically devised all the colors. He has made this whole house along with the entire community. The best part about this is that it can resist earthquake. Possibly not the 8.9 magnitude of the Japan, but of course it can take till possibly seven. It is environmental friendly. It has a less carbon footprint, and it is still unique, and it still blends with the entire environment. Compared to that, this building, it says, "I am very special. I am iconic. Huh? Please, nobody is like me." And this building, actually, because of its form, is uh, known as erotic gherkin. It's a Saint Mary building in London financial quarters. It is also known as crystal phallus, see, of building basically because it's unique identity. You know, people start also giving names. But then what happens when basically people building like this keep on coming? You know, people like this saying, "I am special. I am special. We all are special." This is what happens. You know, there is no cohesiveness. Everything is basically unique. They do not basically come together into one harmony. Now this whole idea of being unique. Identity, individualness is something which is a very Western thought, and that's something what we are basically getting into it. We all are basically somehow trying over here. You know, major of the people also been saying that you have to do something. You're great. You can do. You know, this is the manner of doing it. I think uh, we have to do something substantial, but we don't need to do really gaga about it. You know, we can be ordinary. We can be normal. We can be humble. Like this village. This kind of village, if you go around throughout India, you will find such kind of villages. And if you really look at them, basically all the houses, they all kind of look alike. Huh? They do not have a character of saying we are individual. Huh? At the same point, even if you consider a temple, which is considered basically a little above, God is a little above, but God also gets a very similar character because it is our God. You know, we are part of that. Now, as we go a little closer. When they say it's unique, does not mean basically. When they say it's like a whole, does not mean that they do not have a character. 
each place, each house also have a character, you know. It's like you're all sitting over here, you're all a student over here, and each of you also have a certain character, and that also needs to be blossomed upon. Let's say that each man has its own identity when it comes down to over here. Now, who basically brings this kind of identity? It's the local people, it's the local crop which starts giving. <coughs> when you really look at such basically villages, there are also large scale buildings which come over here, which also have basically a very similar identity. Now, why am I so much stressing about something which is a regional identity? Because I think we all are kind of moving a little away from that. Uh, so coming to the point of basically the ordinary buildings, what we call as vernacular traditional buildings, why does one need to study them? Look at this image and if you see, it's all series of basically buildings together. When one looks at it, it seems it's not planned. It's actually a chaos at that level. But there is something called inherent order. Now there is a little change and a shift right now over here. We have been talking about order from chaos, right? And when we think about an order, we think that as if things has to be in line, things has to be organized, you know, one by one, one by one. And that's the order for us. I think we have to move beyond that notion of an order. There's something called an inherent order, and which is very much perceived. When you look at all this, there's an organic order among this building. You go a little closer and then you start realizing there's some kind of a semblance, something which is emerging as an inherent principle which starts coming out of this. This house is basically over here, they all actually align east to west, you know, all of them. None of them have a south entrance. Now imagine basically 60,000 houses all have a very similar principles, very similar order, you know, of behavior. If you still go much closer from a busy street, you know, into a normal street, then you'll see that their planning also has a sequence to it. Yet, it does not hamper an individual nature. You see, the Otla, this is where basically the women would sit down, you know, the men would sit down and gossip and bitch and haggle around with it, basically hawkers everywhere around. Now, the interesting thing is that it persists. These are all houses what I'm showing you are from basically Gujarat, you know, from a major part of the city. You know, of various, and they all are still similar. It's very similar, like we all, basically sitting over here, are individual, yet we have a very common identity. And hence it is important to understand that common identity. <coughs> As we go a little closer, this is where you start seeing actual principles, actual orders, you know, where it is very apparent at this point. Uh, <coughs> Now, the fact is that this order, we are constantly talking about this whole idea of order. Order means regimentalism, you know. What we have over here also, even if you see your buildings, even if you see rooms, everything is planned, everything is cut, 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 you know. Even the way basically things which are kept over here, you know, all the tables, there is a certain amount of planning. People are here, the faculties are here, speakers are here, some students are here, you know. So there is, there is a whole issue of ordering at that point which somewhere also starts hampering individuals' creativity. What we need to understand is that there need to be a larger framework within which an individual can perish. <clears throat> now, if you see, this is the same people who have basically done that. And now, they've also got a freedom to express themselves. These are the kind of images what an artist, basically, what a craftsperson takes it further, you know, and expresses within that given framework or a boundary. That boundary is very important at this point. Now, the fact is, okay, how does one basically go into studying something which is ordinary? How is it that I have learned from them? How is it that I learn from them? I need to be in an equal position to do that. But there needs to be a kind of a system in order to do a study. We all have been basically talking about, uh, uh, various speakers have been talking about education system and there is a very linear system. Now, the way I have been going about teaching at some point, we generally do not follow a very linear system. There is a very inherent kind of a uh, mismatch to various things. So when you want to study something, especially in the field of design, architecture or something, uh, there are various systems one which needs to go through. What I'm very interested in basically talking about is a kind of a field work. And uh, I'm not very sure but at the engineering college is, is it only a classroom based learning or is there something which is beyond classroom, beyond learning. 
and <clears throat> what we need to know is we need to learn from the environment from the people around and not only from the people who are basically heads teachers lecturers you know one needs to basically expand the horizon so i'm going to talk about field work why field work because there is a lot of experiential learning there is a lot of intangible learning there is something called textbook learning something which is very formal education and there is a need for a non formal education which is very much important uh, what biblo is talking about something which we need to bring a kind of a chaos into things and i think that something which is very important now when you do something which is a field work i have been take from 20 to 40 now when you take something which is that kind of stone into a remote villages you know within himalayas within kumau within gujarat rajasthan various places uh, you need to plan something but you cannot plan possibly everything so wow well, one thing which is important is basically the travel you know uh there's a great learning essentially in travel and we have been basically traveling to various places now when one basically essentially travels there are huge amount of chaos because just imagine there are 40 people you know each time i tell them you know not to carry more than two bags but you know what happens people need to carry their lotions their sunscreen you know their vanity bags and their sandals and shoes and everything and they cannot stop actually as a matter of fact today when we came down over here even my wife basically she carried four bags you know for one day you know i hope she can see me sometime uh, but see this is this is what happens you know even if you tell them it's not possible and, and just imagine 40 people carrying five bags you know 200 bags how do you handle manage that many bags you know and we end up losing lot of thing and then there's a lot of drama and crying and blah 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 things which keep on happening you know but it's all part of learning it's all part of this and hence you somewhere find that among that whole chaos you know there is some kind of a learning which happens there is some kind of an inherent order a working pattern which starts getting established now when we generally go on a field on a site you know we need to record something now when you are basically recording you use various means we have got camera illustrations things you know but when you're doing this the people also become a part of your learning process now what i'm trying to somehow state is that these are the ordinary people you know and they have got lot to offer <coughs> my classrooms basically are not limited to the classrooms to the environment but they are basically in the gaushala where this guy is basically drawing so even the cows become an inherent part of the learning process you know it takes time to basically sit down in that kind of thing where it's smelly it's dingy it's damp but it's important to do that the students basically you know are doing the work and there are a lot of villagers who also very curious they would come down they would share what has happened their fathers grandfathers forefathers have built those houses and it's important basically to know that now when basically on the field will find group of talented people what we have been talking about entrepreneurs people who have basically skills at that level one needs to understand that skills lie at various places among various levels you know it's not only in the formal education that one needs to basically hone the skills it is at this level also one of the finest artists i've seen at this age is this young boy you give him anything and he would draw it with single line he would not lift his pencil he would not use eraser at this point we are very surprised at this thing and basically they also get subjected to a creativity at some point so we also don't leave them we are also little contagious we also want to leave some mark and, and it it kind of becomes a kind of process you know back and forth at that level uh <clears throat> another thing that we essentially do while basically doing a field work is a uh, measure anything that you need to understand you need to measure somebody has been talking about success one needs to measure success one when we are talking about ordinary houses we need to do a measure right so we do a measure drawing and hence basically at various places in various situations it's cold rain snow minus 2 degrees does not matter one needs to do the work <coughs> and basically when you're doing this there's a whole set of mimicking process because the people around the villagers those kids they become a part of it and they essentially start learning so they start mimicking that process 
in the end what happens is that there is a back and forth learning as what I have been talking about that we are not special. We need to be at an equal level in order to have something which is a flow of knowledge. Otherwise, if it's something which is like this, there's only one flow of knowledge at this point, which is what happens in the formal education. This is where something which is non-formal education, where it keeps on shifting, you know, at this point. <coughs> Another thing what happens is uh, group discussions on site, on field, you know, and uh, Basically over here, even all the audience include all the villagers, right from age of possibly 3 years old to 80 years old, and they all become part of it. They do not need to register like TEDx. They all always there, you know, whether you want it, you do not want it. And secondly, basically, you do not need to pay for the food. It's free food. Gaumwalas, villagers, they all offer free food at this point. You know. And it is all part of the learning. It's a process where you also basically, we also cooked, you know, when we are at the place. What you see, the top image which is over here, at this point, this one. This is a village in basically Marshall, Japnati. It is at around 12,000 feet high. Uh, somehow we managed to reach there through bad, bad roads, you know, the car slipping and finally we reached there. We are 46 people. We enter the village and this guy says, uh, Alright, good, good, Sabji, how, how. We had gone a day earlier just to check, to scout. And said, how, how, great, great, you guys have come, he said, we have to eat. He said, we have told you, we will not get food here, we will not get food here, what is our? He says, no, 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 come on, come on, come on, there is a food which is ready, come on, come on, come on, come on. I was curious enough to know what is going on. He says, if someone died in the village, then his rituals, he has food ready, you all eat. We have to eat. Come on, 46 people. Forty-six people in a village you cannot get a meal. That's the meal. We all had that meal. That's this. Right? This are all our drivers basically who are cooking with us. We cook, they cook. You know, so there's a whole learning process which happens back and forth. Uh, now when you're 24 hours together, 15 days, it's not all work work. There's a lot of fun also which happens. So when you start looking basically we had attended wedding to basically garbas to one thing which is about Gujaratis is that they can do garba anywhere. <laughs> Trust me, anywhere. Huh? Name it. You know, if I start keeping garba over here, there are possibly one or two Gujaratis over here. They'll come down on the stage and they'll do the garba. Huh? So we can have that LXD kind of thing, LXG. You know, League of Extraordinary Gujaratis, possibly. You know, at this point. So. That's 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 our identity when we say as that, not as an individual. Huh? It's something which is important to do this. Now, why am I basically stressing that why it's important to learn from this? Because these are the ordinary people who have made such a plethora of knowledge. They know a lot of things. Huh? They know beyond this small, there are people who know a lot of things. And I think it is important to recognize such people. They have created basically wonderful, marvelous architecture which the knowledge they have got from their grandfathers, from the parents, basically to them and it keeps on transferring them. Now what is happening is lately due to this whole individualization, commercialization, it is important to record this knowledge. It is important to analyze, it is important to put basically this. Otherwise the future generations, what basically one of the person was talking about, it is not going to, they will not see this light. Uh, now, it was somewhere pointed out in this little introduction that I have authored two books. You know. So both these books, basically Naksh and Matra, they essentially look at the local, ordinary architecture. You know. And looking at such a vast plethora of architecture, it somewhere tries to give you a glimpse of little bit and pieces of it. Uh, the first book basically took around four years of making and the second one took around three years. A huge amount of people basically involved when it comes down to making and hence when Aizamov basically wrote 400, I was like, wow, you know, but I kind of, he wrote it as an individual, I think, I believe in something which is collective and hence my students from the first year to final year to people from outside, researchers, everybody has been a part of it. Just giving you a little glimpse of those two, I think it's a little difficult to see because it's a little burned out, but this is the book from the first, where there's a some kind of a order which basically I have tried to bring, looking at the wood carving of the traditional houses of Gujarat. Now if you look at, there are around 
God knows. Four, five lakh houses, if you have to study them, you need to have something which is a framework. You need to have an order, basically. And you need to bring that knowledge into a certain format. That's the first one. The second one basically looks at some of the local vernacular houses, basically. Ordinary houses in the local villages. Now, what we are trying to do is understand how these houses are built. How people live within these houses. These are also earthquake resistant houses. They are local houses, they are sustainable. We are talking about issues of sustainability. These people know it since 400 years and they have been practicing that. You know, and somehow we are keeping them away. Media does not know about them. Nobody wants to know about them because nobody wants to go to the villages. Nobody wants to study this. People all want to have something which is net-based, media-based and not the field-based knowledge. Now, <clears throat> apart from basically putting something this together, I strongly feel that whatever we do, whatever we learn, it is necessary to give back to the society, give back to the people from whom such knowledge have been basically taken. Uh, we went back to Himachal Pradesh after we basically put down the book together and started basically giving books to the people. Now, uh, the amazing part basically which happened during that was uh, in this house, this people basically they had a son and their photograph was there in the book. We try to basically give credit to everybody. So the book has everybody's photograph, everybody's image, you know, and who all have worked on it. And their son's photograph was in that and the son died basically two months ago after the event. And so now basically that publication holds a lot of value, an emotional connect. What basically started with the first lecture that something which you require along with science, along with intellect, is the emotion, is the passion and hence that's something which I completely agree with and that's something which is important. But it's necessary not to have one way process but to have something which is giving back process is very important. So people who are basically at this field should understand that. Now, very interesting quote, which I'm just going to end up with uh, from the Facebook basically, that they live in the world of fairy tales, world of magic and deceit, full of monsters like us possibly, and which is dwarfs, pipe poppers, magicians, where simple, ordinary human beings who live outside these walls, outside such fraternities are called muggles, and they hope to possibly live happily there. Thank you.